I'll start the recording now. Right. Uh, so we'll begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, discussion on mining displacement and matrilineal in Meghalaya gender transitions, authored by Dr. Bitopi Datta and published by Rutledge in 2022. This book studies how development induced displacement radically restructures gender relations in indigenous tribal societies. Through an in depth case study of the Indian state of Meghalaya, one of the few matrilineal societies of the world, it analyzes how people cope with conflicts in their perception of self, family, and society brought on by the transition from traditional modes of living to increased urbanization, and how, how these experiences are different for men and women. It looks at the ways in which this gender change is experienced intergenerationally in different contexts of people's lives, including work and leisure activities. The book also investigates people's attitudes towards matrilineal structures and their perception of change on matrilineal, where mining has played a role in building their view of their matrilineal tradition. Drawing on extensive interviews with individuals directly affected by this phenomenon, the book, part of the transition in Northeastern India series, makes a significant contribution to the study of DID. It will be useful for scholars and researchers of urbanization, gender studies, Northeast India studies, development studies, minority studies, public policy, political studies, and sociology. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Dolly Kikon, uh, the author of the book, Dr. Bitopi Datta herself, and Dr. Ritupanna Patgiri to discuss the book with us. Uh, Previously, Professor Tiplut Mongri, uh, who hails from Meghalaya and who's done extensive work on uh, Meghalaya, was supposed to be with us in the discussion. But unfortunately, due to uh, health reasons, she had to withdraw uh, from today's discussion. Uh, before we begin, I would like to very briefly introduce our speakers to all of you. Dolly Kikon is a senior lecturer in the Anthropology and Development Studies program at the University of Melbourne. She received a PhD from the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University in 2013 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Social Anthropology at Stockholm University from 2013 to 15. Her legal advocacy work and research continue to focus on land ownership and resource management in Northeast India, including extra constitutional regulations like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act of 1958, She's a senior research associate at the Australia India Institute and hosts the Melbourne Researchers in Focus Conversation series. She also serves on the Council of Advisors for the India Forum. Her research focuses on resource extraction, militarization, development, uh, human rights, migration, gender, and political economy. Bitopi Datta is an assistant professor at the School for Liberal Studies at the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies. Dehradun, India. She has a PhD from the School of Law and Government, Dublin City University, Ireland. She has been an Irish Research Council awardee scholar by the Government of Ireland and has four books on displacement studies, including one on traditional method of conflict resolution to her authorship. Prior to joining the UPES, she has taught, at, taught in TIS and continues to be associated with filmmaking with a production house called Vortex Films, whose first feature film production has won the National Films Award in 2021. Uh, she is one of the pioneers of the queer movement in Northeast India and was the co-organizer of the first queer pride walk in Assam, which took place in 2014. Her research interests include gender and sexuality, indigenous people, displacement studies, and qualitative research. Ritupana Padgiri is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Indraprastha College for Women, University of Delhi. She holds a PhD in sociology from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Before this, she has completed her master's in sociology from the Delhi School of Economics and a bachelor's in sociology from the Lady Sri Ram College for Women, University of Delhi. Uh, she holds a postgraduate diploma in conflict, transformation, and peace building from Lady Sri Ram College for Women. And she is of course, one of the co-founders of the Doing Sociology Group. Uh, so welcome to all our speakers and our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us today. 
uh, very glad to have all of you with us today. So just to begin our conversation, I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Kikon to, you know, maybe put forth her thoughts on the book. So uh, over to you, Dr. Kikon. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. So thank you so much for this, for this time and uh, for inviting me to reflect together on the book. Uh, Bitopi, uh, congratulations on this wonderful, uh, amazing moment. You as your first, um, I think, yeah, your first book um, and, and a long PhD journey that came to an end. Um, you know, very successfully, I've I've followed your your career and also your journey for some time, and have admired the way that you have been so focused on um, on supporting and showing solidarity to so many movements around in the region and beyond. And it gives me great honor and also. Um, Kind of, you know, uh, a space to to be nostalgic because I I think I met you at the Northeast Social Research Center as a young researcher, and you work very closely with uh, Father Walter Fernandez, and it's very clear in terms of talk, uh, you know reflecting on your training both um, as somebody very involved in advocacy and also uh, perhaps in um, in the activism world to do with. Uh, displacement studies, you know, to be working closely with your peers at NESRC, and also the trajectory when you applied for your PhD to go uh, to uh, Ireland. Um, it's been a long journey, and it's amazing to see how everything has come together in your first book, where you focused on mining, displacement, and metrilini in Meghalaya. And these are three terms, I think, which in a way are very significant taken for you, both uh, you know, as a feminist and as an activist, very uh, dedicated to the region. I, I read this book with great joy because you know, I also did my PhD on, on mining, on resource extraction, and, and was really happy to see where you're taking the work. And as, you know, as a researcher, somebody who is also focused in the region, this has really been you know, a dream and an aspiration for me that, that you know, fellow researchers, uh, students who are doing their PhDs, doing their research, really joins a community to be thinking together about the region, particularly on feminism or on indigeneity, on resource extraction. And this is such a timely and an amazing contribution. So congratulations to you, Bitopi. Uh, thank you so much, doing sociology for bringing us together. I think I'm just gonna make some very few um, reflections and comments about the book and uh, you know, give, give the space to uh, Ritu Parna so that we can listen to her. And also I think more importantly to the audience who are, who are joining us on Facebook live streaming and also here in this, in, in this Zoom meeting. I really want to start with the dedication of the book where Bitopi dedicates the book to her mother, late uh, Anima Datta. And I think it's very important for us uh, as feminists, as people, researchers, activists, you know, practitioners together looking at the region that we don't really often divide scholarly book, academic work, work from the lived experiences and what we have gone through. And it's very meaningful that, you know, I'm, it gives me kind of honor to be to refer to your mother who's, who's, you know, who's really very much with us in spirit and also in the making of this book in your life. And also your, your, your late sister, Karabi Datta, who I taught you, you say to, you know, <laughs> to dream and to fly and, and definitely to your father, um, Kushewar Datta, who believes in you according to you more than you believe in yourself. And this is, I see a book of love, a book of dedication. Um, it's very important that we invoke people who matter to us and your acknowledgement is very beautifully written. Your advisors are all there with you in this book. What really in a way spoke to me about your book and 
I was very happy to read was how all the all your life experiences, both as an activist and as an amazing researcher from the region, as somebody very grounded in thinking about gender, about feminism, and also about activism, you bring it very beautifully in your book. There are seven chapters for our friends who are listening to us in a sense of understanding Bitopi's book titled Mining, Displacement, and Metrilene in Meghalaya. The first two chapters very succinctly uh, locates us within the entire conversations about development-induced displacement. And also, in a sense, why is it important to actually adopt a feminist lens? One of the things that Bitopi does in the first two chapters very beautifully is not only locate the entire important study done so far on development-induced displacement, but also bring in the gender framework and show us why it's important to actually have the indigenous women's life experiences and, and, and stories important as an analytical tool, as an analytical framework. It's an exceptional book where she's able to draw both from a global debate that's happening all across invoking uh, scholars like Kuntala Lehi Dutta, looking at Indonesia, looking at Latin America, the continent of Africa, the conversations here, I think from scholars in Australia talking about extraction and gender, but at the same time, bringing the context of Meghalaya in the third chapter. And I think it shows both Bitopi's training and also her dedication, uh, telling us why her focus and her commitment to understanding mining and gender is so important in the region that we come from. Given that Bitopi really centers life narratives and life experiences, which I also call storytelling, as a core to understand how theories are produced from the field. This is an important book that we should focus and actually we should reflect as we read. From chapter four onwards, after the first two chapters of analytical framework and then contextualizing Meghalaya, which is really an important chapter for us in a sense to understand the chapters following uh, chapter three, I think chapter four, five, six, seven, very beautifully focuses what I call, right, the, the expertise or kind of the, the training that Bitopi has as an ethnographer. And, and I was very privileged in a sense to look at her, you know, her draft and some of the chapters. She came to Melbourne and, and we, we, we spent talking about, about her then PhD as she was writing. And I could sense that this was going to be a very important book for all of us, not because Bitopi is somebody who really believes in, you know, just making an abstract concept out there and living it. She really wanted to center the place. And one of the conversations I, I, I remember having with Bitopi as she was working on the drafts and really focused post field work was uh, situating stories in place. And she was very devoted to that. She kept referring to the place, the coal mining place, Ladrimbai. And you know, those of us who know the Gentia Hills and, and the town, you will understand in, in terms of really the precarity of mining towns. And that's something I also refer to in my book uh, when I was writing about the foothills of Assam and Nagaland. Bitopi does an exceptional, amazing job of looking at metrilini of gender of mining in Ladrimbai. And what is beautiful about this book is that she not only centers extraction as such, but she centers everything that's happening around extraction, the seasons, the food, the smoke fish, the oranges. And what this book suggests to us, what Bitopi is trying to show us is that, listen, right, as these transformations, as, as, as these lived experiences take place in these mining towns, see life as it happens. And I think that's really central to understanding the Northeastern region and how research is done. And this will go on to be one of the many amazing books written in a sense that give us the cosmology of the lived experiences of extraction in the region. If you're listening to me, you know, if you're a researcher, do pick up this book and look at what it means to be an ethnographer. Look at what it means to be, you know, part of a journey where where in a sense, like Bitopi started out, 
a young researcher working in the research center in knew her, looking at her entire feminist advocacy work, really as one of the founders of the, of the, of the pride in Guwahati, and at the same time, not dislocating what it means and what is important to look at actually the ongoing transformations. And I think that's key. That's key in a sense. So the, the, the beauty of the chapters that she talks about, particularly if you look at chapter five, growing up in a mining area, uh, a lot of things happen in mining towns. And I think one of the, one of the ideas here is that Bitopi is very, very focused. Her lens is very focused on the intimate and really the everydayness of it. And it comes, I think, from a very, very amazing uh, space where she's very well trained both in a sense, you know, be, being the feminist herself, being an activist, and also paying attention to small details. And I really love reading this book. Um, the final chapter is amazing, <laughs> Bitopi. I think it's really, really a beautiful book on, on gendering, love, marriage. Um, the, 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 the chapter four, five, six, seven, in a sense, I think what it really shows us is the is the centering of stories and why they matter, and especially for, for feminist scholars looking at extraction and mining. Why is it so important that we kind of center stories? Um, Bitopi, you have done an amazing work, and I think I will I will congratulate you once again, and I will give the time to my colleague Ritu as She kind of, I think, continues conversations with this book, and I'm and, and very happy you know, to hear more about this. One of the questions that I have for you as I was reading this is, you know, what happened to the framework of, um, for instance, I think you talk about sexual violence, but I was thinking about the lens of militarization and 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 whether whether that, that lens or that framework mattered to you as you were writing that book. So that's one question for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vivan. You've uh put that very beautifully. Uh, so Rituparna, over to you next uh, to share your thoughts on the book. Thank you, Dipali. First of all, uh, I wasn't sure what to say because I became a panelist on this in the last moment, but it's an absolute privilege to discuss Bitopi's book because she has been a senior and I've had the privilege to know her before. And she's, uh, like Dr. Tikon said, one of the most dedicated people with a great training in ethnography. And her book, although I read it, uh, you know, maybe more hurriedly than I should have, was an absolute pleasure because it has taught me so much, particularly at a time when I'm trying to bring my own PhD thesis into a book form. And as Dr. Tikon has said, I would actually absolutely concur that it is a beautiful piece of ethnographic work. And I have also read it with the lens of a teacher because I have been teaching sociology of kinship for the past two years now in the University of Delhi, as well as sociological research methods. And I would like to actually bring in some of my observations from the lens as a teacher as well as a researcher. My work hasn't been on a Meghalaya and uh, you know displacement directly, but I have some familiarity with these ideas of kinship, gender, and intimacy. As Dr. Kikon has already pointed it out, that this is a book with seven chapters and an introduction and conclusion. The book has actually a very good mix of theoretical and empirical work, and it is absolutely striking at the first reading itself. Some of the points that I would like to sort of pick out from the book uh, include, first of all, some observations on the methodological context that she sets. And as uh, Dr. Kikon also said, Bitope is successful in painting a picture of Meghalaya that gives us a sense of how societies have transitioned from one form to another. The diversity in methods that she uses particularly strikes me as a sociologist, as an ethnographer, who would want to also sort of, you know, know and understand how to do that. Uh, one of the ways in which she tries to capture the experiences that women have is through uh, recording oral testimonies. And the queries primarily target these structural socio-cultural contexts uh, within which both men's and women's narratives are captured, particularly located in their specific historical junctures. So that is something that you know we as ethnographers are also uh, trying to learn as well as as teachers trying to discuss and teach our students. And I think she is very, very, uh, 
successful in doing that. The other striking part in the methodological context is the uh, focus and discussion on ethical issues, uh, at, particularly at a time when anthropology and sociology have been on the way towards decolonization, as well as talking about how ethical responsibility something is something that researchers carry when they do, uh, you know, the kind of work that they are doing. One of the ways in which she uh, sort of makes an attempt at making her position clear is uh, by talking about the fact that she communicates with the public uh, about her findings and as well as, uh, you know, this idea that the public or the respondents, the participants uh, should be made aware of what the findings have been from the research that has been conducted largely on uh, people who are not asked in that sense uh, as academics or researchers. And I think that is a very important intervention. We also saw uh, the kind of ethical issues that some other anthropological works have run into in the recent past. And therefore, this was a very, very refreshing take. Um, the other point that sort of struck me was the anxieties, particularly the masculine anxiety about matrilineal, uh, matrilineal society in Meghalaya. The book, the book blurb itself says that uh, it is one of the few matrilineal societies in the world and the way she is able to capture the anxieties that men particularly have because of the nature of the society in Meghalaya is very, very striking. Uh, the interconnection between civil society and these anxieties that are reflected in the numerous attempts that have been uh, you know, made to overthrow the matrilineal system of Meghalaya in order to liberate men from female dominance is also very interesting to me, uh, particularly when, you know, in sociology of kinship, we teach uh, the case study of the Nayars, and you can see that, you know, matrilineal amongst them is also discussed in similar veins. So there are these cross-cultural comparisons that came to my mind and I sort of reflected on them in terms of how uh, these anxieties of masculinity are reflected. Connected to it, uh, the point about the insider-outsider conundrum or the way migrant men, especially uh, from other regions, are treated. And she is again talking about it through ethnographic examples in which uh, the Khasi men want the women to marry within their own communities because they see other men as a threat to their land and property rights. Now, this can also be observed in several other tribal societies uh, across the Northeast as well. Again, sort of indicating the larger general patterns that exist, which Bitopi is trying to bring out in her book on Meghalaya. So in a way, uh, there is an equation of matrilineal with unscientificness as well as barbarism by uh, primarily men, where they are attempting to abolish matrilineal for what they believe is not a modern scientific uh, way in which societies should function. So these anxieties that are reflected in the ways in which kinship is understood, again, sort of interested me and I thought that they were really, really interesting. I also liked how she talks about aspirations, negotiations, everydayness, as well as leisure, because uh, when there is a transition from uh, the traditional or the so-called traditional mode of society into a modern, increasingly urbanized one, these ideas become very important. What does leisure mean? What does aspiration mean? I mean, these are all questions that become important to be uh, probed sociologically as well as understood more. So questions of leisure, aspiration, negotiations are all tied to how gender itself is experienced and in its larger connection to mining. So uh, these are some of the themes that sort of immediately came to me, apart from the things that uh, Dr. Kikon have already sort of pointed out. And I must congratulate Bitopi once again on the very wonderful book. It was a pleasure reading it in terms of the ethnographic nuances, the theoretical details that you were able to bring out. And I only hope that uh, more and more people, not just from uh, the Northeast, as we know it, but also outside, pick it up and read it. Uh, if it was up to me, I would definitely recommend it as part of, you know, any reading ethnography course or uh, a research methods course. Uh, I absolutely enjoyed reading it and thank you. Hopefully uh, we have 
some very interesting questions that you're able to sort of respond to. Thank you so much, Rituparna. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Datta, would you like to respond to the two speakers? Sure, thank you, Dipal. Um, I'm at a loss of words, actually. I was pretty nervous when I started out because Dr. Kikon has been a mentor for many years. So, uh, this book, if you have liked reading it, it's also because uh, if it's appearing very well trained, it's also because I've been trained by them, uh, including, uh, I remember going to Australia and I was so nervous that I couldn't just write. I was, I, I wasted the first 10 days chilling here and there, roaming around. And Oliver was like, if you do not write, you're not going to finish your PhD. <laughs> and, and it was right. And it was like, the moment I'm like, you know, I have to start writing because, um, and also there's this yearly uh, ethnography workshop that uh, Dr. Kikon organizes every day. I have been particip I have participated in it um, for more than a year, many times actually. And also the informal conversation, Dr. Uh, Barbara Sanjay Barbara is also here. It's also been like very, you know, a very great mentor and guide for throughout. So if, if whatever quality, if uh, there is that you see in it, it's, it's all because of all of this. Um, I couldn't have done it alone, not at all. I mean, no, not at all. Um, that I can sure, say for sure. So it was, um, so when actually Rituparna actually said, would you like to go first? I said, no, I would like to go last and not say anything because I just want to listen. So it's sometimes good to listen, you know, and especially when you know that your mentors are sitting, you're like really nervous. You're like, okay, with my pen and pepper, I'm just sitting here, you know, ready to take notes. And I was like, no, no, I don't have anything to say. I'll only listen. So, so it's so, so when, when actually Dr. Started, uh, Dr. Kikon started speaking so generously, I'm like, and she's a very strict, uh, sort of mentor so you know it's it's very rare that you actually hear you know such I, I, I was I was overwhelmed I'm still am so I do not know what to really say uh, thank you so much um, Dr. Kikon uh, Dr. Barbara who is here I'm um, not being sociology Dipali for everyone um, for coming and uh, being there um, uh, so this book um, definitely was a work of passion I mean I took a long time to write it. I mean, I did not take a long time to just write it down. I wrote it in uh, two months, but then I took three years to just think about it because if you see, there's a lot of stories that are actually coming up and um, they were coming up sort of like as a whole. So to sort of compartmentalize and connect and uh, build a thread that actually runs logically uh, because the, along with the theoretical framework that I had in mind, because the theoretical framework is important to me because I wanted the ethnography also to speak to theory and also to policy. Um, and at the same time, I wanted it to be written in a way that everyone can read it. You know? Um, it could be read, read as a story form uh, from chapter seven, whoever wants to, if, even if that person is not an academic, or also policymakers who are actually looking for um, some information while before making policies, also sociologists or displacement studies scholars, um, yeah, ethnography, of course, methodologists. So all of it put together, I mean, it, it took a lot of time. And of course, I had guidance. Um, Dr. Kikon was there, Dr. Barbara was also there. So. Uh, along with my uh, PhD supervisor, Dr. Eileen, who actually gave me a lot of freedom to do it the way I wanted it to do, I wanted to do. And um, so, so it's all because of, because I had all these amazing people supporting me that I could uh, write something. I do not know if I can ever write something like this again, if I do not have these people with me anymore, but then this happened and I'm so grateful for that. Um, um, having said that, a very interesting question that Dr. Kikon asked about the lens of militarization. Um, it is indeed very important uh, for me, the lens of militarization, but then when you're asking me now, and when I consciously think of it, um, the questions that I actually asked uh, the participants um, when I asked those, uh, this theme of militarization did not appear too strongly in the context of Meghalaya as it did in my former research on displacement in, um, say, uh, or not, uh, sorry, in Manipur or even in Nagaland. In, in Meghalaya, uh, this was not as paramount that I could actually sort of embed the whole uh, militarization discourse in it along with the other sort of discourses I'm dealing with it. So I felt that if I try to do that, um, I might not be able to do justice to it uh, because, you know, why say uh, something that I'm not very confident about uh, and, you know, destroy the cause for which uh, the whole region has been fighting for such a long time. 
Um, so that's that's why uh, I consciously actually did not also put the lens of militarization in it because I did not um, get that lens strongly enough from the interviews. I mean, and I did not want only the theory to speak about what's happening to the region um, because I did not have the narratives. And the reason also probably also because might also be because I did not ask very specific questions about militarization and conflict. Uh, because my lens was so much about sociocultural urbanization, probably that was um, in my mind. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that is just the best answer that I can actually uh, think of right now. But uh, definitely for the next research that I pick up, I would consciously take it in the mind because I do understand that it is a very important uh, angle and uh, another uh, perspective to um, look into and not just look into and build it. Um, <clears throat> I had actually initially thought of uh, adding one uh, chapter on militarization extra, but then I thought that would be an addition. And I did not want to treat militarization as an additional aspect of this whole issue because everything else, if you've read the book, you see that everything is very embedded. Um, so when I talk about uh, the lives of people, I talk about society, politics, economy, culture, everything uh, together in an embedded way and how they intersect with each other. So it is intersectional as well as interdisciplinary. Uh, and I did not want um, to uh, separate militarization without uh, being able to uh, show the embeddedness of it in people's day to day life. So also that's another conscious reason why at the end, I um, did not include it. Um, otherwise, I'm thankful. I'm so um, overwhelmed and um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kivan and, and Vituparna. Um, uh, Sanjada is also here if, you, if he might, like he was also my external examiner, by the way, during my, uh, uh, in my uh, research, like, you know, in my defense. So he's also read um, my thesis uh, from the book thoroughly, so we also love to. I mean, I like I said, I have nothing to say. I've said whatever I wanted to say, and this is the backstory, and, you know, it's, it's, the book is yours now, guys, whatever you make of it you know, love it, hate it, it's, it's all yours. I'm here to just sit down and listen and take whatever comes and the feedback that I receive from you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Opi. So, you know, now we'll go ahead and take some audience questions. But before that, uh, I think uh, we'd like to hear a few words from Dr. Barbora, you know, because like you said, he was your external examiner as well. So he's familiar with your work. And uh, Rituparna has a question for you. So uh, Dr. Barbora, uh, I'd request you to maybe uh, share a few words with us and then Rituparna, you can come in. Yeah, no, I mean, congratulations, Bitopi. I think this was a, um, I mean, we were really looking forward to this book. And I think my my question remains, you know, um, as the one that I asked you during your, your as your external examiner, um, where does one go in terms of, um, you know, one of the things that as sociologists, as social anthropologists, we do is try and make sense of these patterns that emerge from um, our modern life, right? Um, and these patterns are not, they're not looking very good as we, as we kind of proceed into the, next, uh, into the next decade. So where do we go from here? I mean, Meghalaya is not a very uh, stable state in terms of garnering resources. Um, at the same time, it is a, an extremely fragile place in, uh, in you know environmentally and ecologically uh, as uh, as i was listening to you um, i was looking at you know uh, at, at the devastation that has happened not just in uh, in assam but also in silhet and and meghalaya is so closely linked to both so in a sense uh, where do we go from here is a question that i would like to ask you and what kind of dilemmas emerge as we move forward Uh, perhaps let me just add my question so that you can answer them together. So you were talking about how you didn't want to add militarization as a lens because, you know, it would just be an addition. It's a very important point because today we have this tendency of uh, scholars going to do fieldwork with a set theoretical framework already in mind. So if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, your own positionality as a researcher and 
you know how your ethnographic findings sort of dictated your theoretical framework Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Honja, for that question and also Ritu for that, uh, for your question. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, I can also see some questions coming on the chat, probably. Yes, there are two questions in the chat box. Uh, so after answering these two questions, you can come to. Um, the, first que the, the first thing that I see, um, um, as a researcher on Meghalaya, or first as, as the writer or author of this book, or, or you know, or even more as a spectator um, of what's happening in Meghalaya uh, from a distance now. Um, first is this, uh, we really need a strong will, uh, I mean, to address the issues as they have been unfolding. Um, by uh, that will, I do not mean to say that people do not have will, people do have, but then, um, I mean political will, um, and um, so it cannot be uh, that you know mining goes on on one hand and it's there's destruction everywhere and on the other hand we're trying to revive all the traditional festivals saying that this will balance it out it doesn't work like that so we really need a sustainable uh, sort of lens of looking at what's happening and the political will um, along with social and you know cultural without uh, really going back. Uh, to handle this. This is one thing that I think, uh, are we willing? And uh, if we are willing, to what extent are we willing and how far are we willing to go to not let this happen uh, in, to uh, this place, um, to this beautiful place? The first is that. The second I think is uh, um, we need a lot of policy uh, reforms of how we look at displacement. Um, if I look at displacement um, in, in, in itself in particular, um, how the World Bank even currently looks at displacement and rehabilitation, it's also very sort of um, limited. And this is something that I have extensively argued um, in my book. So we need more context specific interventions and policy interventions, which is sensitive to the context and also the cultural context in which um, uh, we are located. Uh, the third thing that which I feel is um, within, if I, if I speak of the community in itself, the state in itself, um, I think we have to, I mean, this, when changes or transformation uh, sort of occur, occurs, all communities go through the anxieties that uh, probably Meghalaya is going through. But then here the situation is a little different because change in itself is not bad, but the price that is being paid, uh, paid for the change and um, the factors that are actually driving the uh, change and the capital uh, in itself, which is actually sort of determining the content and meaning of the change is scary. Indeed, indeed very scary. So, um, so as a community also, we have to find our own footing, but exactly because I see culturally, I see Meghala dealing with a lot of sort of different cultural forces because mining uh, has introduced an entirely different Culture in itself, uh, the community has its own cultural context. So all of these are conflicting. And then there are a lot of um, policy confusions in there, um, the NGD sort of whole history and how the government also has been a sort of, you know, um, trying to address all of this differing aspects in very differing way. Uh, you know, like when I said, you know, mining is happening, but then, you know, we're trying to sort of hold on to the culture by celebrating, um, traditional festivals or trying to say that, you know, let's go back to farming because we do not want to lose that knowledge. So these are all, I see a lot of conflicts in there. Uh, and I feel uh, we have to find our own footing. I mean, uh, in that sense, uh, a clarity of uh, what do we want to take uh, from the past or from the tradition and how do you want to deal with how things are happening right now at the present and what do you, how much do you want to take and what do you want to take at what cost I, is the question I feel also as a community one has to ask. Um, so yeah, these are the three things that I actually can think of policy interventions, of course, but then it will be nothing if there is no political will and political will be nothing if there is no social or cultural will to find our own clarity in amidst this chaos that's actually happening. I mean, where do we want to go is the question that has not been asked 
very seriously um, yet do. But then there could be an answer, which is what I believe. Uh, but then um, that answer has to be collectively sought out. I mean, it's not one person's sort of, you know, battle, it's everyone's battle in there. So a really a real need uh, for people, uh, uh, politicians and also activists to come together and have a conversations and listen to each other of where do you want to go and find a clarity in here is the beginning of this whole journey. So, so where this journey would probably take us is something that will unfold in time, but then um, I feel that could be a good beginning uh, to start with. Um, and Rituparna's question on, uh, sorry, Rituparna, could you just briefly repeat your question? Yeah, yeah sure. So, you know, I wanted to know about how your ethnographic work has sort of dictated the theoretical framework that you have used, rather than it being the other way around. As well as some bits, if you could talk about, you know, your own positionality as a researcher, because you are an Assamese and not from Meghalaya. So, you know, because uh, uh, some of our audience is also young students and researchers who are taking notes on how to do ethnography. So it would be good to get insights from you. Right, great. Thank you so much. I think it's a very important question because uh, materially is something that I devoted most of my time to uh, before I started writing or conducting the interview. Right? And even much, as much as I read, as much as I did my literature review, equal time I actually devoted to uh, methodology. So I started working on the methodology from, you can say, if not day one, then day seven itself, because I was reading side by side. I was also sort of developing the methodology, thinking about it. One thing that I knew when I, before venturing into the field is, I knew what I did not want to do. I did not exactly know what I wanted to do. I mean, how do I want to structure the content? What exactly is the story that I'm trying to tell? I wanted to tell a lot of things. That was not, to be very honest, that was not very clear um, in my mind. You know, um, I had a broader research questions. Yeah, you. I had the basic things that is required uh, for one to start with a PhD, but I really did not know uh, what it would look like or what, would, what it would turn out to be. So apart from that broad sort of guidelines of my research question, I really had no idea what is waiting for me in the field or what is waiting for in the next two years. But I did know what I did not want to do. I did not want it to be um, a research paper or a research work which treats people as objects of inquiry. This is something that I knew that I did not want to do. And the second thing I knew that wanted to, I wanted to do equally was that I wanted to treat the people as, as subjects and not as objects of inquiry. And I was ready to do anything that would actually make them the subjects of inquiry that would bring their voices to the forefront. And the third thing I wanted not to do was that, you know, um, I did not want to be the spokesperson of the community. I did not want to be that. I wanted people's story uh, to be told the way they reveal and the threads that would actually sort of uh, appear when the stories are put together. I wanted that threads to sort of reflect on itself and give me the analysis, you know, uh, without my brain um, as an Assamese or as a person who is not from Meghala or, a uh, or as a person from a particular sort of training, uh, which also again is Eurocentric, uh, I was very mindful of that, um, that I did not want sort of my lens to sort of color uh, the whole thing. And um, these are the three things that I knew. So which is why when I actually ventured into the field, I had read extensively on the space literature. I knew what were the main major arguments. I knew how the World Bank has been arguing. I knew, for example, say how Dr. Walter Fernandez, who also has been uh, my supervisor, has argued. I knew how um, um, uh, uh, Mike, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Charnia has argued. I knew uh, all these big names who have actually shaped and played a very important role um, in, in sort of shaping the trajectory of displacement studies and how it affects people. I knew the narrative. I gave enough time um, to understand it. Um, and I also knew what I did, that I did not, what I did not want to, that I did not want to reproduce or replicate what has already been said. I wanted the same story uh, probably to be told in a different way, or probably I wanted a different story to be told altogether. I really did not have any idea. And this, when I'm saying this right now, uh, I'm actually going back uh, to the first year of my PhD. Uh, 
that, you know, I did not want it to be a very clinical sort of a paper where it looks at problems and events and impacts. I wanted people to come alive and I did not want my lens to color everything that is going to come up in the field. And I wanted people to be subjects. And I wanted to be very humble as a researcher and not sort of um, let whatever I think um, I'm, my arrogance for yeah, whatever my training to color everything that might actually happen later. Um, use it as a, of course, mental faculty, but not uh, let it ideologically color whatever content might come up. So when I went to the field, having said that, uh, that that's the first part. Having said that, when I went to the field, I asked questions from childhood till um, old age. And I asked the same sort of questions to three different generations. And as the stories coming, started coming out very strongly, um, that is when I started developing probably my theoretical framework. I did not have a theoretical framework when I went to the field. I knew what I did, but I was not very strictly sort of adamant about it, that this is how uh, the story has to be. And so, which is why I waited uh, a long time. I, I, I did my field work. I took my data back, sat on it for a long, long time which is also when I went to Australia, I was unable to write a word. So uh, I sat on it for a long, long time and um, let all the stories come up. And then as I started coding, um, there are big patterns that actually started emerging. And then I started seeing, oh, this team on mobility, oh, this team, this is, this is exactly the team on relocation, or this is the team of displacement, uh, or this is the theme on rehabilitation. And it's being, it's an entirely different story of how the policy, policy literature has sort of, you know, uh, addressed it. And so I did not take the policy literature as a reference to tell the stories. The stories itself referred to the policy literatures. And, and this is what uh, is my conclusion or the last chapter is also about, right? So after, so, so, so that, that was, and, and then when all of this, you know, these stories actually came together and they were so intersectional, diverse, and also so interdisciplinary in nature. I, I thought that, no, let me tell the story. literature First, tell them what's the problem, uh, what I find is a problem there, and of course, what, what are the great things there, but then also what, the, what is the sort of uh, gap that I want to build. I kept it in the first two chapters, told the whole story of the people uh, from chapter four onwards, and that runs like an independent narrative. And that itself became the critique. So you do not have to really go component-wise to the standard, or say the mainstream, or say 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 the you know standard literature of this placement. That itself sort of became the critique. So um, for me, there was no. I mean, the way I see, it, there is no one clear path um, of how this is to be done. Uh, but I think uh, for me as a researcher for whom the field is very important, I let the field speak to theory rather than the theory speak to the field. So for me, the field is more important than the theory. It doesn't mean that the theory is not important, but theory that the field is so much sharper and it can inform the theory in such astounding ways that it said the truth is stranger than fiction. It really is. And I let the field do it you know, itself. So what I did as a researcher, I only documented it. I mean, gave a little bit of thought and it was very accurate. And probably this is where ethnography comes in. We should give so much more importance to the field than we have been giving um, ever. And that itself will do the job. Um, yeah. So sorry, I mean, I babble, I'm sorry. I ramble a lot, but it's very hard to uh, exactly uh, tone it down to just a few lines to say exactly how did it happen. But then it's very exploratory. I think that's the beauty of exploratory research. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Vitopi. So there are two more questions in the chat box. Uh, one has to do with uh, equitable distribution of property uh, law on that. And the other has to do with tourism. Uh, I'll very quickly read out the questions and, if, uh, and then you can answer them. So. Uh, there's one question on how uh, there was uh, recently there was an attempt by the KHADC to bring a law on equitable distribution of property. 
uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, another development that took place uh, is a visit of certain communities from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Mokinru and uh, Katar Shnong uh, blocks where women have become part of the Darbar uh, Shnongs. Uh, there they inform the CEM that they will soon have a woman uh, headman. Uh, so what do you think of this? And there is a, uh, there's another question on uh, tourism. Uh, which uh, is re in reference to the Lamshong Caves. And uh, do you feel overall, historically and at present, tourism has played a role in inducing development-related displacement as well as added to ecological de degradation in Meghalaya? Given that tourism also garners local economy, uh, can you talk about this dilemma a little bit? Sure, thank you. Great question, actually. Um... <clears throat> All right, the first question about, um, okay, there's another, anyways, I'll go with the first questions. Um, the Tembak HRD see to bring equitable, a law and equitable distribution of property and about uh, pointing, pointing women as um, in the Gardarwars, right? Well, um, let me think about it. So, because we're discussing the book right and in this context I'll, I'll write i'll try to address this question in the light of the book that i've written um see i'm not against equitable distribution of property or uh, not against uh and of course not against the idea that women should uh, not become um, or should become uh, the you know uh, the should not be appointed in the darbars as norms but um The, the comment that I can actually think of, because I do not again want to uh, make it sound, uh, give out a rhetorical response saying that, you know, um, great women, there should be more women leaders, there should be. But if I place it in the context of the book, uh, I want you to look at this goat argument in the in the, in the light of what's happening in the larger reality of sort of Meghalaya. Right, um, and in fact, this is there's this actually a program, district uh, development program. When I was actually conducting the field work, where uh, the government has been uh, inspiring uh, people to appoint uh, women as leaders of uh, of you know uh, the village development councils, and um, many have actually sort of celebrated it. And there also have been questions. So there also have been people have asked questions like, "Who will do the housework if women go and you know uh, play the office in there?" So this debate that um, there should be equal distribution of property or um, that there should be more women leadership, uh, great, great. Uh, but then also see where are these two arguments also sort of coming in from the idea of women's right, the idea of um, feminism or the idea of how women should be empowered is also sort of here borrowed heavily from outside or from a, a lot of Western feminist understanding of uh, women's rights. I am in for uh, women's political representation that we definitely need, but does it mean that because we are talking about men's and women's equal rights, do we get do away with matrilineal? Um, in that context, because um, this is also, uh, SRT actually sort of uh, argues that um, we understand, uh, uh, this, this is something that I've actually read somewhere, and, it, and they said that we understand uh, the problem of, uh, you know, women's subordination in other societies, because this is exactly our state um, here in our place. So, so you are saying that you sympathize or empathize with feminists because you are feeling the same in that context um, of the region itself, which, and which for me is, a, is not a correct argument uh, from what I am sort of arguing in, in the whole book. So um, I would not directly say that, you know, uh, equal property, division of property is bad. No, I would not say that everyone should have equal distribution of property. Everyone should have equal access to property rights. There should be women leaders, but I do not want these two arguments to be totally dissected and asked in a vacuum um, from what exactly has been the mining politics in the whole state of Meghalaya. 
So uh, that actually would itself uh, be a whole discussion in itself. So where would you, when you actually take this argument and then place it, for example, say in the chapter where, uh, where, where I've discussed on um, masculinity or uh, discussed on um, how men feel, um, you know, under matrilineal nowadays. If you actually put this, uh, put this question in that chapter, chapter four, I guess, uh, then uh, how would this, uh, you know, question frame itself or what would be sort of the answer? So for that, you'll have to also read the book and to exactly understand what I'm trying to say here. So uh, I cannot, I do not want to answer these two questions in vacuum dissected from the larger argument that I have made in the book because that will completely defeat the purpose of why I have tried to argue whatever I've tried to argue in that book. So that's um, there. Um, those who have read the book would exactly understand what I'm trying to say. Um, so I, I really do encourage you to read. If chapter four, the, 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 yeah, the man versus me, female perception of matrilineal. And then I would want you to ask the question yourself, this one, this question, right? So this is, that's mine. Um, tourism itself, I do not think, I would not, state tourism as a single standalone factor that has done everything more. Um, see the idea of the idea is inflow of money, the idea of in, you know, um, inflow of or uh, intervention of a cash economy and what uh, it does to a traditional agricultural sort of community. I mean, I mean, a lot has also been written on that, how I urbanization, and, you know, the idea of modern development actually sort of changes, slowly trend changes it. So, in the context of my Meghalaya, I would not say that it's tourism alone which has done it. It's along with mining. Uh, to me, mining is the central uh, force uh, which has shaped everything else um, in Meghalaya. That's how I see it, okay? And this is what I have argued in the book. So, um, no, I'm not against tourism in itself, but then um, I am um, skeptical about um, how all of this modernizing uh, forces have become sort of forces of displacement, uh, not just physical, but social and cultural displacement. So, uh, so if tourism combined with that argument will um, give you will give you an entirely different story rather than just saying that you know tourism what but but what tourism gives man people money there's no problem with people having money but then you cannot this question is not as simple only as that I mean. Uh, there's mining going on in the region. Um, there's there's tourism happening. There's uh, so many other things happening, right? Uh, and it's all of it together that is actually creating the reality for of Meghalaya as it is uh, happening right now. So um, I would not say that you know ban tourism, but then I would also say that the first question that Dr. Kikon asked, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, sorry, the second question that uh, Dr. Barbara asked, that where do you go from here? Yeah, I mean, I would again. Um, reiterated that you know um, how do we want to do everything that we want to do um, keeping in light of whatever is happening in the present all right and again not a very clear yes and no answer but then i think real life is complex right and we cannot just simplify it and say that you know yeah. because you know a similar question was asked when mining was banned a question that was asked oh these guys do not want us to want us to get rich and which is why they got us the ban um, this question is also asked to activists, but what do you do? We are poor, mining is giving us money. So nobody is against anyone having problem money or probably there could be people with the argument is not that. It's not about nobody, I should not speak about, again, I'm, I'm speaking about myself and my argument. The argument is not about, not against having money, but the argument is about this intrusion of a cash economy along with other forces of modernization and most importantly mining that is shaping the reality for uh, Meghalaya and the matrilineal tradition, matrilineal state that is Meghalaya and uh, this question has to be sort of asked and tourism also one part of it and not the whole of it. Yeah, right. so, um, right. uh, so there are two more questions and I think we'll end with those uh, two questions uh, today very quickly. Uh, there's one question, uh, uh, on, uh, you know, what were the challenges that you faced while doing your field work? Because a lot of places uh, or, the, you know, field sites which you visited would have been, uh, you know, probably not easily accessible, etc. And uh, the last question is on uh, uh, 
how you talk about patriarchal patriarchal matrilineal in your book and uh, so do you think this is the uh, because this is the cause of friction as uh, one sees in uh, uh, the society there or do you think it is the the development induced displacement uh, which has brought about the gender transformations uh, in contemporary meghalaya i think of uh, that was jyoti das's question i hope i've understood it correctly so if you could very quickly answer those two questions and then uh, we'll uh, close yeah fantastic questions actually um, also very complicated questions if i actually start thinking about it um, all right so how did i uh, how did i get access um, i mean i've spent almost a year in the field it took me a lot of time um, there was a time when my idea was taken and also circulated among people's network so it's the the the, the fear of the you know the, the anxiety uh, when a researcher actually from outside goes and tries to you know research on something as sensitive as mining and metrining um i mean and the anxiety is uh, connected with it is very understandable this is also something that i've written also in my book um and um and um i had um, great people who had supported me um i had uh, the, the villagers but then uh, after a few visits uh, they have been kind enough and actually did trust me um with my work because i told them i'm only a phd researcher on the best uh, i can do is probably you know tell your stories to the world um, and um, not coming here with any big promises i'm only a student researcher and this is what i'm going to do so uh, of course i cannot guarantee you anything great in return but of course this is this is something that i can promise you that it's not i'm not going to harm you if i cannot do anything good to you at least i'm not going i'm going to do anything that probably sort of harms you so if you see all of my interviews are anonymous um there are a lot of um, effort uh, of trust building that actually goes into it all researchers qualitative researchers especially ethnographers know about it already so i had uh, support i had um, on the village uh, uh chiefs and uh, the village uh, leaders and also um um uh, the community people were very supportive i must say um it was not that you know i had to break a bone to actually go and get this no it was not like that i think because also it was built done over time and it is their generosity that i could actually uh, get so much of information so the community was very sort of supportive in that sense i would the 100% credit of fit actually they trusted me more than probably i even trusted myself um in the field um as someone who's going from assam has never actually gone to a mining area i mean i was skeptical myself but i think i was taken with uh, more trust than i had expected it's it's that um how did that happen um does that not happen to others i do not know but then it did happen to me so the community itself is very trusting um so it's 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 that um okay okay this done assure um repa kaba right please get in touch with me you can take my email uh, from uh, rituparna dipali and please get in touch with me if you need any help with respect to your you know with with, with your work i'd be really happy to help out and i really mean it please write to me okay um patriarchal matrilineage okay this is interesting now again patriarchal matrilineage is not a blanket term okay when i say that patriarchal matrilineage it's the same for everyone it's the same degree across generation no it's not and this is something which is why i did a intergenerational study and which has which is why i said that experience of matrilineage for the older generation of people was extremely different from a uh, sort of the middle generation and when i say older generation middle generation there is a age criteria which i can i have described discussed in the methodology section you can go back and check it there but then um, what i have but what i have argued is that uh, this patriarchy um in the matrilineage uh, that was always probably there but it has deepened over the years is what i've argued so it's it's not been the same so the older generation of women were still much had much more voice um we are much more liberated and empowered and um uh, that uh, life or uh, way of life itself was less uh, patriarchal way less patriarchal than it became during the mining boom years and i think i do think that mining did have a role to play in that 
right? Um, so uh, it's said that if you actually look at other uh, matrilineal communities across the world, it has happened that with urbanization, uh, many communities have become, as they're getting outward, reaching out to the outside world, they're becoming more and more patriarchal in, uh, in world, in themselves, whereas they're more progressive society. Um, before this is something that has happened in Indonesia, in Australia, it also happening happened in India in among the Nairs and also happening in, in Meghalaya. But then, when you have an additional element of um, med, uh, mining in it, uh, that process becomes even more sharper. It it, it does something um, which probably it, it it changes things. It deepens that progression to a deeper sort of you know stronger patriarchy of what otherwise would have probably happened in 50 years 60 years down the line it might happen in 10 years or even less than it um this is what actually because this transition or this transformation that i've recorded in Meghala only is, is only 30 to 35 years of maximum 30 to 35 years old okay but then if you see the content of this transformation it it, it feels like it took it's 100 years of, of transformation the kind of um, changes that have actually happened. So yeah, um, displacement, and which is which is why I say you know mining displacement and matrilineal displacement definitely has played a part in de in deepening this patriarchy. But and when I said matrilineal is patriarchal, patriarchal matrilineal, I do not mean it as a blanket term, which applies for everyone uh, of. Uh, of for all women and men across all generation. Um, there's a qualitative difference in experience of that patriarchal and matrimony. Um, and as you go through other uh, generations, it's, it's, it's very different. So if you look at the youngest um, generation of women right now, um, they will have a very different experience of matrimony. It's, 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 it's uh, like I've argued in a book, it's something um, that um, it's, it's a mixture of the freedom that the grandmother said, and it's also something that I've learned in the classroom. So, so it's that, right? But then I should not even make sort of that comparison as an afterthought when I say among generations, but then it's not a blanket sort of term. But yes, in one line, yes, um, displacement has been a reason um, for whatever is happening uh, for, for the gender transformation and um, and patriarchal matrimony, uh, of course, it's always been there, but it has been moderated and intervened by mining induced displacement, which has produced a kind of uh, experiences that women have had in their lives. Um, that would be the one line, but then there could be an essay explaining this whole question following up from there. Thank you, Bitopi. Uh... Before we end, uh, any final comments, uh, Dr. Kikon, if you'd like to say a few words, and Ritupanna. Thank you, I think I've... Hi, Ritupanna, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, I think I've said everything. So please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Dipali and Bitopi. I learned a lot about, I think, the work and, and in terms of the methodology and what you were looking at. And I, I was just um, perhaps, you know, thinking about your work and, and thinking about what's happening with extraction around the world. And, and given that you're looking at indigenous communities and extraction, um, you know, in, in, in this region, my, Perhaps my, you know, the, the conversation that that, that 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 takes place in the futures to come would be how how does the violence of you know the destruction of the landscape begin to eat us up, right, as a community, and and what does it mean? And I think that's really core and key. Um, in the it as as you were discussing this, you know, Bitopi, it also reminded me that how often for, for me as well, who is like very, very devoted to research in the region and you know, talking to scholars like yourself, I often think that the kind of research we do in the northeastern part of India is actually plugged into and, 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 and kind of like is keyed into larger indigenous conversations that's going across the world. And, and right now I'm thinking about thinking about Latin America and, and the two, uh, the two uh, comrades who were killed, the journalist and the and the activist. Uh, and in a sense, I think the killing of the murder of Dom Phillips and the Brazilian indigenous expert Bruno Pereira in itself shows us a lens to the future 
of, of how central this kind of extractive conversations will become in the region. And it's amazing that your work sits there and so many of our works together will sit there with the floods that's happening, with extraction as it goes on. And you rightly point out, Vitopi, like what do people do, right? On one hand, there's this entire um, narrative about, about, about activist groups being opposed to communities who mine. And that's in a way, I think, uh, related, like you rightly say, to conversations in, in Australia among indigenous people who are pro-mining and anti-mining. Um, and so I think we are part of a global conversation that's happening from stretching from the Amazons to the Himalayas, in a, in a sense, to, 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 the, to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you know, a continent like Australia. And I think that's where perhaps I would, I would think that the importance and the relevance of all our work together um, is, is kind of located in that future of uh, solidarity and the future of thinking together and how it impacts all of us as communities. So thank you so much. That's it. I'll stop rambling. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kikon, Dr. Datta, and Jitu Panna, and to all our participants who were uh, present with us uh, and you know, made this afternoon slash evening so very interesting. And to everyone, please grab a copy of uh, Vitopi's book. It's a, it's a very interesting book. You've heard about it today. And I'm sure uh, you'll like it when you read it. So do get a copy, a special shout out also to Anane Koshal who helped us today with the management of uh, you know the whole event. So thank you so much, Anane. And, uh, to everyone, uh, please follow uh, Doing Sociology and we have more such discussions and we have more such discussions in the future. And thank you once again, everyone for joining us today and have a great thank uh, you. evening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, doing this, Doing Sociology. Thank you so much, Dr. Kikon, Kikon and Dr. Barbara for having, being here and everyone, uh, all the participants. Uh, it's been very happening. Uh, I'm so grateful. Uh, I'm still very overwhelmed, but I go back with a lot of positive um, positivities. Yeah. Vitopi, Vitopi, we are going to do roots and bridges again. Yes, we and have.